This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. They say a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, but a journey of a billion miles, according to the National Space Society, will require 31 steps. So today we are continuing our look at becoming an interplanetary species. We're using the National Space Society's Roadmap to Space Settlement as a loose guide, and I've linked the complete document in the episode description. In Part 1 we took a look at the first steps on the roadmap, developing some space-based resources and commerce, lowering launch costs, and establishing a permanent foothold in orbit. Today we'll discuss Part 2 of the roadmap, Utilization and Development of Cislunar Space, though we'll not hold to it too rigidly. Some of these milestones are projects we've looked at before, so I'll mention and link those episodes as we go if you want to dive in a bit deeper. Cislunar space means between Earth and the Moon, but I frequently use it to refer to Earth's entire hill sphere. This is the volume that Earth gravitationally dominates, which is about 3 million kilometers wide. It is the region in which objects could stably orbit Earth and includes all Earth's Lagrange points with the Moon, and also Earth's L1 and L2 Lagrange points with the Sun and we'll discuss what those are very shortly. Essentially, all the space that moves with Earth and is reasonably close to Earth, the places where we'll develop the space infrastructure that needs to be in the vicinity of Earth. That is an immense volume, over 10 million times the volume of Earth. It is of course mostly empty space, at least for now, but it is valuable space. Essentially, this episode and part 2 of the roadmap are about establishing permanent inhabited development in the space around Earth as a preliminary to Part 3, establishing that same sort of presence on the Moon. Though we'll also contemplate the further development of the Cislunar region after the Moon has been settled. You might ask why this is also inextricably linked to the Moon, and the reason is it's where we need to source our materials for heavier Cislunar colonization. Indeed as we'll see today, and looked at in industrializing the Moon and battle for the Moon, it's not just the Moon and a few space stations we want to colonize. A future interplanetary humanity will see a trillion habitats and space farms and power collectors dwarfing the Earth and Moon in prominence and population. A massive cislunar constellation of which the Earth and the Moon are just the brightest stars. And it's from the rocks and dust of the Moon that we can build that cislunar empire, including our staging point to other planets. I should mention that there is always something of a chicken and egg situation when you're planning infrastructure. You need some basic infrastructure in place in order to get to the resources, out of which you'll build more serious high capacity infrastructure. That's true whether you're building roads to mines in ancient Sumer, or building the equivalent of roads to mines on other moons and planets. So it might seem sometimes like this road map is going back and forth, back and forth. But we need to get material from the moon to build the space infrastructure that will let us get even more material from the moon so we can venture even further outward and so on, and this is what the NSS roadmap is laying out. To start, we have to industrialize cislunar space though, and that brings us to NSS Milestone 13, our first milestone for today, the use of space technology and resource on and for Earth. Right now our presence in space is mostly about science and curiosity, though we do have some of the space-based economy and utilization we looked at in previous episodes, but to create our space-based civilization we need to first use space resources to benefit ours. Only in this way are we likely to see the funds and drive to really hit space in a big way. All the forms of this include satellites for communication, not to mention other remote detection for everything from military surveillance to tracking agriculture, finding mineral deposits and archaeological spots, and possibly better earthquake detection. We also have the biology and medicine side of things. Living in space requires skill at recycling, which can obviously benefit us here at home and it requires advances in understanding ecology to maintain small biomes in future space stations, also benefiting us here, but it could open us up for all sorts of biomedical microgravity improvements and breakthroughs too. There is also a lot of industry which can work better in microgravity, or even only work in microgravity, and we detail those in our episode Kickstarting Space Industry. We also have space-based solar power, both power transmission and orbital mirrors, which we'll return to in a bit. Key notion, while we are looking up into space for our future, that future relies on us looking down from space to Earth, making that space development useful to Earth. Before we proceed with the NSS roadmap, 
Let's take a look at the physical map of Cislunar Space and where we'll be building the key pieces of infrastructure. Working our way upward and outward, first we have Earth's own primary orbital zones, low, medium, geosynchronous, and high. Low Earth orbit is where we currently do most of our efforts in space and is anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand kilometers above Earth. It is essentially inside Earth's atmosphere but just high enough that the air is too thin to create a lot of drag. Medium orbit is a vastly larger space, everywhere from a couple thousand kilometers to 36,000 kilometers up, an ideal place for large space-based enterprises as is close to the Earth but not in the cluttered low orbit region. Geosynchronous is the narrow spot between medium and high orbits where objects orbit Earth at the same speed the planet spins, so is of great interest to anyone who needs to watch over or communicate with a particular spot on the ground. And high orbit is everything beyond that. If you go high enough in orbit, you begin to interact more with the gravity of the Moon. Some other important places to develop and utilize in cislunar space colonization are the Earth-Moon Lagrange points. Any pair of planetary-sized bodies orbiting each other, which really means orbiting around their mutual center of mass, sets up five points labeled L1 through L5, where gravity and centrifugal force on an object orbiting along in time with the two bodies will be balanced. It's not as stable as an object in orbit around a single body, but you can park something there, like a way station, habitat, factory, or relay satellite and keep it there. The Earth-Moon L1 point is between two bodies, about five-sixths of the way to the Moon. This Lagrange point is unstable, meaning something could orbit on exactly that spot indefinitely but any tiny deviation from orbit will increase exponentially with time. It's fairly easy to see why this point is unstable. The Earth's gravity, Moon's gravity, and centrifugal force balance out there, but clearly if you drift slightly closer to the Moon, the Moon's gravity will now be slightly stronger while the Earth's is weaker, so you'll be pulled even closer to the Moon. So a satellite park there would have to perform what's called orbital station keeping, monitoring and periodically adjusting its position with thrusters, but this actually takes very little fuel if it's done precisely and when you've only drifted a short distance. And this same instability makes L1 the ideal place for a transit station for personnel and cargo, where transferring into Earth orbit or into lunar orbit is so easy, requiring so little change of velocity, that you have to be careful you don't do it accidentally. The Earth-Moon L2 point is about one-sixth of the way out past the Moon. This will be an important place for relay stations communicating with the far side of the Moon, which never faces Earth. And in fact the Chinese Lunar Exploration Program currently has a relay satellite up there, not directly on the L2 point but what's called a halo orbit around it, in a plane perpendicular to the Earth-Moon axis, which gives the relay satellite unobstructed continuous line of sight to Earth and to the landing site of their lunar rover so the signal is never interrupted. Someday L2 satellites will provide the same surface to far side colonies. We might imagine that in the future, a populated and developed Moon would want satellites that remain over a certain spot, just like the geostationary satellites orbiting Earth. But unfortunately such lunar stationary satellites would orbit so far from the Moon, one-fourth of the way back to Earth, that the Earth would just capture it. So the L1 and L2 points, and the manageably unstable orbits around them, will also be crucial infrastructural points as the only places to put lunar stationary satellites. The Earth-Moon L3 point is perhaps not so interesting, because something parked there is really just orbiting Earth at lunar distance, but on the opposite side of Earth from the Moon and the Moon is so far away it barely affects the orbit at all. The L4 and L5 points each form equilateral triangles with the two orbiting bodies, and they are different from the others in that they are stable, as long as the larger body in the two-body system is at least 25 times more massive than the smaller, which is the case by a wide margin for the Earth-Moon system, Earth being 81 times as massive, and easily applies to the Earth-Sun system since the Earth is only 3 millionths as massive as the Sun. This stability means that satellites can simply be parked there and not drift away. In fact rocks and dust tend to naturally accumulate at L4 and L5, and these are often called Trojan points as we found large groups of asteroids at Jupiter's L4 and L5 points with the Sun and named them after characters from the Trojan War. Earth's own L4 and L5 points might one day be convenient places to live far enough away from the Earth and Moon to have your privacy but still close enough to visit or get supplies. There was in fact an L5 society found in 1975 that advocated building an O'Neill cylinder habitat at the Earth-Moon L5 point, but in 1987 the L5 society merged with the National Space Institute to form the National Space Society, and incidentally that's why it felt appropriate to explain Lagrange points at such length in the course of discussing the NSS roadmap, 
because it hints at how important Lagrange points are to the folks of the most active interest in colonizing space. But the Earth is also part of the Sun-Earth two-body system, which has its own five Lagrange points. The two of greatest interest to near-Earth infrastructure will be the two closest to Earth, L1 and L2, which are both around 1.5 million kilometers or .01 AU from Earth, four times farther than the Moon, respectively in sunward and anti-sunward directions, and both are already home to important space science missions. L1 is also an ideal place to put things like solar shades to cut down on infrared light hitting Earth, or just power production, as things like solar panels, mirrors, or shades, all thin and thus all can be used as minor solar sails to help with station keeping around L1, and this solar pressure allows the shades to get closer to the Sun, increasing their effectiveness. Thin solar shades with radiant pressure on them from the Sun are not limited to the orbits stable for large or dense bodies, and thus can be placed in atypical orbits such as the statite, which can hang directly over the Sun, or the lagite, which can orbit at periods slower than their distance from the Sun would normally indicate. For this reason a solar shade at the L1 point is not actually at the L1 point, as its point of stability would be closer to the Sun than L1, depending on its thickness. The L1 and L2 points also mark the edge of Earth's hill sphere. Three solar physics missions have been orbiting the Sun-Earth L1 since the early 2000s, the Advanced Composition Explorer ACE, Solar Heliospheric Observatory SOHO, and the Global Geoscience Wind Satellite. The Deep Space Climate Observatory joined them in 2015 to serve as an earth early warning system for coronal mass ejections and for the study of space weather. Coronal mass ejections are a potential hazard to space infrastructure, and they are not the only space-based damage we have to worry about either. One critical issue for developing cislunar space is all the space junk that accumulates there, especially if you're building up in a big way. While actually safer from asteroids than Earth is, since space stations can easily move aside to avoid being hit, things in cislunar orbit are not protected from the far more numerous but tiny objects that our atmosphere burns up protecting us and to a lesser degree objects in low Earth orbits. The Sun-Earth L2 point is a fine place for space-based observatories and is the future home of the long-awaited James Webb Space Telescope. The Earth doesn't fully shade the L2 from the Sun, because at that distance the Earth is actually slightly smaller than the Sun, but having the Earth and Sun always close together and in the same direction makes shielding experiments much easier. A simple large reflective sunshade will allow a telescope to cool to around 50 Kelvin, which is especially helpful for infrared astronomy and observing the faint, ultra cord cosmic microwave background radiation. Now as you start getting more and more objects up in space you will need to be able to move people and cargo between them, not just back and forth to Earth, and this is where Milestone 14 comes in, an integrated cislunar space transportation and logistics system, one able to move folks between all those orbital zones and Lagrange points we mentioned. That takes fuel and is where we again turn our eyes toward the Moon. It actually takes far less fuel to get off the Moon's surface and back to low Earth orbit than to get from Earth to low orbit, even though the distance is a thousand times farther. It can seem counterintuitive, but remember, it's accelerating and lifting mass out of a gravity well that consumes fuel, coasting vast distances is free, and the Moon's gravity well is much shallower than Earth's. The payload of a rocket coming from Earth is usually less than one twentieth of the mass of the fuel to get that rocket to low orbit, meaning for every liter of fuel you send to a fuel depot in low orbit, you'll burn at least 20 liters getting there. But coming from the Moon's surface only takes about as much fuel as payload. Needless to say, it makes producing spaceship fuel on the Moon, as opposed to Earth, very attractive. And while we're talking about fuel, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that travel around cislunar space isn't limited to using rockets, even without getting into some of the launch-focused megastructures like orbital rings we discussed in the Upward Bound series. Once you're out of an atmosphere, everything about motion is about Newton's three laws and the conservation of momentum. For one thing to move in one direction, something else has to move in another. In terms of rockets, that counterpush is provided by trillions of high-speed particles in that rocket flame but you can use any mass. You can kick off the side of a space station in a space suit, and it lacks the gravity to pull you back, especially as it moves backwards with the same momentum, mass times velocity. Much larger space stations won't move much from such an exchange. Kaplana 1, the beautiful mid-sized habitat, whose animation by my friend Brian Vorstig of Spacehabs.com we so often show here, is usually estimated to mass on an order of 10 megatons, or about 10 billion kilograms. 
which would cost something on an order of the entire US annual GDP to get up in space with current launch costs, for all that's only around a billion dollars worth of steel. Being so heavy, we can launch ships from it with mass drivers or other types of space catapults without moving it much, and we generate its momentum over time with other techniques than classic chemical rockets, like ion drives or electromagnetic tethering, or even radiant pressure from light. Kaplana, incidentally, is a great example of Milestone 16, the development of the first equatorial, low Earth orbit settlement. The International Space Station can't really be called a settlement, no matter how large it grows, because it doesn't have its own gravity for long term habitation. Sure, you can spend a year or so at the IS in microgravity, with all the problems that entails, but to truly be a settlement, it should allow continuous occupation, or at least long term residency without significant deleterious effects. The case could also be made that a settlement should be somewhat self-sufficient. This means a rotating station with artificial gravity and some kind of biosphere and crops, recycling systems and presumably an economy, or at least a long-term business case. Staying in low Earth orbit means shielding can be minimal by relying on Earth's magnetic field for protection. This significantly reduces the mass required for construction while we're still learning to build space habitats. Most of the station's advanced construction material would be launched from Earth with on-orbit robotic and telepresence assembly. Construction of settlements will take years and the first long-term residents will be construction workers, engineers, and robot operators and maintenance personnel. For a small sense of the project, imagine not just building houses on land, but rather building houses on a suspension bridge you must design and construct first, in Antarctica. The first permanent residents won't move in, or even start packing, until the entire infrastructural construction is complete, inspected, tested, and all contingency and safety systems are operational. During construction, raw, bulkier materials such as oxygen, water, components for engineered soil, materials for concrete or other on-site fabrication such as 3D printing stock, raw metals, etc., can be launched from early lunar mining operations. Lunar materials will likely end up representing a large portion of the station's finished mass, and so a lunar mass driver to keep costs down on bulk materials would have a ready customer. Catching all that lunar mass at your station though will require significant station keeping efforts, you may end up using some of those lunar bulk materials, presumably waste, in a cheap mass driver reaction engine to balance out the momentum exchanges rather than burning precious oxidizing fuel. There is, however, another slow but fuel-free way to get momentum and that takes us to Milestone 17, Space Solar Power Systems. We discussed using solar power satellites in our episode Power Satellites to beam energy down to Earth, and it remains my favorite potential kickstarter for space industry since energy is a multi-trillion dollar sector of the global economy, and you can see that episode for the details of the economics and engineering and safety of power beaming, but it is easy to forget its utility in space too. Obviously a solar panel on a space station can run your electricity, and that can be handy for things like ion drives, which are very slow but ultra-efficient engines, spitting out electromagnetically accelerated ions far faster than a rocket flame does, and thus giving you more momentum for less mass used. But light itself has momentum, albeit not a lot. A square kilometer of solar panels or sail or mirrors provides a mere 8 newtons of thrust this far out from the Sun or about a quarter of a billion kilogram meters per second of momentum a year. This is not a lot, enough to let you chuck a single 100 ton spacecraft 2.5 kilometers per second once a year, but it's basically free for the cost of maybe one ton of solar sail or mirror, as we can make those very thin and light, and can be used in tandem with power generation without too much loss of power or momentum. Needless to say, you would need a lot more than one ton of chemical rocket fuel to push a ship up to 2.5 kilometers per second. That station mass around 10 million tons so giving it 10,000 tons of sail, or a 100 by 100 kilometer square, costs only 0.1% more mass, but offers 10,000 such shuttle launches per year, not one. You can also be using it for power generation and running a slow ion drive, which again uses fuel but vastly more efficiently than a rocket does. So you might electromagnetically catapult ships around orbital space from big space stations and run the stations on ion drives to slowly but efficiently recover the momentum. Or simply by the radiant pressure of light, again solar sails and mirrors are dirt cheap, especially if the dirt you're sourcing them from is lunar regolith, and if you have a large collection of mirrors and power beaming stations up there for use on Earth, devoting some of that energy to things like pushing spaceships or blasting space debris is a handy use for surplus and you always want some surplus generation. 
We're also not just talking power here. A big space lens and mirror might be hundreds of kilometers in area while weighing nearly hundreds of tons and able to direct that light into a nice diffuse spread out beam of sunlight to places we'd like to warm up or just light up, even ignoring potentially using them for weather control or warming arctic locales, see the weather control or colonizing the arctic episodes for details, being able to shine some extra light on some crops after they lost daylight to a storm passing by could result in disproportionately huge gains in agricultural output with minimal climatic effects. Of course shipping 100 tons of aluminum foil to orbit to make a sail several kilometers aside is hardly free, that might run you hundreds of millions of dollars in modern fuel costs. A month or so back my friend Joe Scott from Answers with Joe did a fun look at solar shades for possible climate control and pointed that problem out. On the other hand, firing one out of an electromagnetic railgun or mass driver on the moon and letting it unfold itself as a light sail to slow and maneuver into the right orbit is fuel free, all powered by the sun. So we're seeing a value in getting to the moon now, even without considering it for fuel production, which is a somewhat controversial topic as the preferred fuel from the moon is usually finding ice and turning it into liquid hydrogen and oxygen as a rocket fuel, and that might work very well early on, but we don't know how much ice will be there and probably don't want to rely on using the precious stuff as fuel for very long, especially given that water ice is so much more common in the deeper solar system. It is a great one for early days though, as are some others like aluminum, which makes for a pretty decent rocket fuel with just oxygen alone, and they make up the fifth and first most abundant elements on the Moon respectively. Silicon, iron, and calcium come in at second, third, and fourth, with calcium narrowly edging out aluminum. This is where we get to mining the Moon, and specifically by doing it with robots, which we'll look at more next time in the Moon episode, as Milestone 18 is using robots for confirming lunar resources and you may have noted I skipped Milestone 15 earlier, a robust space infrastructure for human and robotic operations, though it's essentially the main topic for today in an overall sense, getting not just that human space infrastructure in place, but that robotic infrastructure too, as so much of what we want to do in space is greatly helped by robotics, especially in the early days. A little rover with a sensor package that we could mill out by the thousands for hundreds of bucks a piece, plus shipping and handling which is obviously way more, and which could be operated remotely by folks at home, is basically ideal for scuttling around on the moon poking for concentrations of resources. Same, a little robot with a welding torch and a fuel tank for maneuver and welding, and an antenna, is a lot easier to use than pushing someone out of an airlock in a bulky spacesuit to go patch the hole. In most ways, robot drones are easier to use in space and on the moon than on Earth, and we see how far drones have come in the last couple decades. But finding ore and processing are both pretty simple tasks. If you got some land crawler on the moon with a battery engine and some solar panels, you can scoop up some regolith and bring it home for processing or even just do it there. Solar kilns work quite well when there's no air conducting heat or convection heat loss off the kiln. There's a cost to building such a probe and getting to the moon, unless you can make it there, but that comes later, and that cost is going to be way higher than producing meadows on the earth for the earth initially. However, the moment you can make a drone that can refine aluminum or iron or oxygen off the moon and cost less getting there and doing so than the material it's making would cost to ferry up from Earth, you are now in business. If it costs me a trillion dollars to ship a million tons of aluminum or steel or oxygen or water up from Earth's surface, at a thousand times their earthly production cost, my robot only needs to basically produce a few times its own weight in those items off the moon before breaking to be turning a profit just because of all the launch savings, and not just in fuel, a lot of rocketry cost is in the rockets themselves, most of it, and they are way easier to build when you're launching from a low gravity airless rock like the moon, assuming you aren't using a mass driver anyway. Now we can probably do way better than sending a one ton miner to the moon and getting a few tons of fuel or metal out of it, but it's an important paradigm to remember. I mention it costing tens of trillions of dollars to put up all the metal you'd need to build a modest space habitat, like Kaplana in orbit, but 10 megatons of steel doesn't cost trillions of dollars to produce on Earth, just low billions, and we do build skyscrapers and aircraft carriers with those kind of price tags, and most of that cost isn't the steel in the building or ship either. Some robot miner, whether it's processing as it goes or just scooping or dragging the material back to some facility, may still cost dozens of times more per ton of product produced than terrestrial operations, but would still be dirt cheap compared to launching from Earth. If we achieve viable resource extraction from the Moon and at less cost than supplying it from Earth, 
we begin the true space boom and the colonization of cislunar space in earnest. We could launch from the moon to Mars, a direct stepping stone, but the moon's real role as a stepping stone to places like Mars and Venus and the asteroid belt and beyond is really as a source of raw materials and fuel. More likely we'd launch from Earth orbit directly, maybe even low orbit itself or maybe way out past the moon at the edge of our hill sphere, but fundamentally all our resources at this point are still on Earth or very near Earth in that bubble up to geosynchronous orbit that's only a tenth of the way to the moon, and not even a thousandth of the way to Mars. In truth it doesn't matter because things get so much easier as we develop our infrastructure. As an example, if you've been mass producing solar sails, mirrors, and power satellites near Earth, even though a Mars-bound ship needs a lot more energy to escape from low orbit than from high orbit, you can't just be pouring light or energy into some sail on the back of a spaceship and getting up to interplanetary speeds then let it use conventional engines to slow down at its destination. It will need the same slowdown fuel whether you launch from deep in Earth's gravity well or the very edge of it. With a large and robust cislunar infrastructure, going to other planets is vastly cheaper and simpler. Indeed you could just send some of those beaming stations and mirrors by robots to Mars to help the ship slow down, allowing very rapid transit that conventional rocket fuel could never allow. Here's the other key thing to realize though. For many centuries to come, even if we are wildly successful in our space ventures beyond Earth, likely even long after we've settled our first planets under alien suns, the majority of folks who live in space will live closer to Earth than the Moon is. We may well be an interstellar empire with a thousand colonized systems under our belt before all the population living outside of cislunar space equals that of what lives in cislunar space. You could put a billion of those Kaplana space habitats into cislunar space, or their big brother the O'Neill Cylinder, without putting a scratch into the Moon's resources, or even vaguely packing the orbital volume of the Earth's hillsphere, each home to thousands of folks living and working there who could still carry on phone conversations with everyone in that volume including Earth. And with the addition of bigger throughput launch mechanisms like orbital rings and space towers, could move back and forth to Earth for costs no different than flying to another continent, be it people or trade goods. That time, when we have a fully colonized cislunar region, is long off of course, not because it's high tech, but because we just lack the population to make it needful, as we're talking billions of stations with thousands of people or even more, and there's not quite 8 billion of us yet. As we head out to the Moon and Mars and beyond, we'll keep building up in Cislunar, and likely do more and more build up there the more we head out to the worlds beyond. More folks will live there than every other world beyond, not because we won't be able to get people to those places, or we'll fail to find volunteers, but because it will be cheaper to live in Cislunar space and still so close to home. To become an interplanetary species then may be a task of millennium, if we define it as when most humans do not live on or about Earth simply because we'll keep growing at home till it fills up, a quadrillion humans later. Fundamentally though, it won't stop expansion and to other worlds, as once we're up in space in a big way, out of Earth's gravity well, everything becomes easier for heading out to those other worlds and becoming an interplanetary species. We talked about a lot of orbital mechanics today, everything from the rocket equation and Lagrange points to halo orbits and station keeping. If you'd like to learn more about these concepts, I'd recommend trying out Brilliant. Brilliant is an online learning site with fun and interactive courses in science, math, and computer science, and they make a great addition to educational videos like these as they let you get hands-on learning and practice with the concepts to help you truly master them and learn more about how our world and our universe work. If you are naturally curious, want to build your problem solving skills, or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new. Brilliant's interactive content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite-sized, understandable chunks, you also have fun while you're doing it. If you'd like to learn more science, math, and computer science, and want to do it at your own pace and from the comfort of your own home, go to Brilliant.org slash IsaacArthur and try it out for free. We talked about the threat of space debris today to orbital infrastructure, and there's always a concern of a large impact on Earth like what might have killed the dinosaurs, and this weekend we have a bonus episode out on the matter looking at asteroid defense. Then next week we'll be taking a look at the future of fission, before returning to the Fermi Paradox series in two weeks to contemplate the phosphorus problem and the idea that a scarcity of phosphorus or other elements might be the solution to the big question of where all the aliens are. 
If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can donate to us on Patreon or our website, IsaacArthur.net, which I'll link to the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.